Hi, this is Paul. Seems to be hot day in the corner. I was watching the uh, Not Estuary show, episode 7, and everybody was wearing a hat. So, I uh, this is my new hat. This is Grim Grizz merch, and it's a it's a denim. That's Denny up there, and this is denim, and this is all part of the, the denim war summer number 2. Uh, I watched the word. I watched the Twisters movie, and and the main leading man walked out of a house wearing nothing but a plain white T-shirt, and I immediately thought of Kale Zeldin. Anyway, I, I actually love you know when I I bought the hat just to support Grizz and to to have a little bit of merch, and I actually really love the hat. It's it's a it's a nice high quality hat, and I wear hats a lot. Because I am a bald man who lives in California. Any of you see old, white, bald men who live in California, even if they're balding, if they're not scrupulous about wearing hats all the time, by the time they get to like 75, 80 years old, the hair on top of their head is like that, that kind of paper that back in the 70s they used to make look antique like with a lighter. So you really got to protect the top of your head if you live in a sunny place like California. And I like a sunny place. So I, I'm just noticing, though, that the brim the brim might be a problem. We'll see. But it's a, it's a great hat. And I don't have a link for you, but I'm sure Grim Grizz will hop into the comment section and uh, put a link below where you, too, can get your, uh, your denim denny hat. And uh, anyway, back, back to the video. Um, one of you... Uh, uh, I don't know if I should name him or not, uh, sent me this video, not this video, but this podcast of Megan Dom. And he says, boy, she's talking about all kinds of things you're always talking about. And of course, Megan Dom has sort of been corner adjacent for a long time, uh, but that never really happened. But she is really very IDW in that she was someone who, a big part of this video is about labels. And what's difficult to, difficult about labels, and actually, see, now, now Teo's, uh, Teo's pitch was about Megan, see, I don't know how to say anybody's name, is it Megan Basham, or is Megan Basham, or Basham, or what, I don't know, but of course, that book has been making its way in the corner, it came up... Uh, Great video today with Sam and Kel and Mo on Defense Against the Dark Arts. Um, and in fact, I'm I'm going to try to get up to speed on Harry Potter. I've seen all the movies. I watched them with my kids, but I've never read the book. So, but it was a it was a great great conversation, and there were tons of really great points that were made throughout the video. But uh, Shepherds for Sale came up in the video, and of course, that was a conversation with Sam. And Esther, uh, sorry, Beth, Bethel, and and Trip, and I've actually had some email correspondence with them too. And I finally bought the book, and I started listening to the book this morning. And I, I've got mixed feelings about the book. I'm really enjoying the new information, which is really what I think the main contribution of the book is, because there's a lot of stuff I didn't know in terms of overt political ways to try to move the needle in American politics through church leaders. That's about the scummiest thing I can think of. But part of my problem with it is that that book, just like I think it bookends sort of Jesus and John Wayne, just at the other side of the spectrum. Although I, I read Jesus and John Wayne, I didn't learn anything because I knew pretty much all of that stuff. That that people people's politics and religion is all really tight and Jesus and John Wayne didn't have any uh, didn't have any evidence. I mean, some of the stuff that I've I've learned so far through Shepherds for Sale has been a little, but it's sort of taken my breath away. Now a bunch of people are pointing me to at Gavin Ortland's book. Um, Fleba says Marsden. There's a bunch of Marsden in it, and even ends with a bit of Bovink. So yeah, that's that's right up that's right up my alley. So that's something that's going to be on the list to watch. But this this podcast, I had my in real life fantasy football draft yesterday afternoon, uh, about a thirty five minute drive out to a distant suburb for the for the draft itself. Uh, the the loser of the league last year always has to hold the draft. So sorry, Lucas. It's great to see your house. Um, 
But so I listened to this podcast on the way there and it was really, really good. I'll put the link below to it. And I've I've tried to listen to Megan Dom's uh, YouTube a special place in hell after the trigonometry video that I used a lot with, with Sarah Hyder, I thought, wow, that would really be a very interesting pairing, but I've never really found, I've, I've tried to listen to it several times and it just never really stuck. Although they did point me to this, this video from a year ago that, and I tried listening to that in the podcast version and it didn't really, didn't really grab me either. But, um this podcast was really good and so let's let's jump in at a certain point to people in general my goal is to have conversations in a way that are palatable to a lot of the people on the left who either can't be bothered to follow along or are so afraid of anything that might be quote unquote right coded that they just won't listen like i want to be the podcast Megan had an interview with somebody and, you know, she talked about this thing that I've been fighting with my friend about. And my friend thinks that everybody who talks about this is a right wing wacko. But I can give her Megan's conversation about this or that. That's what I want to do. I think now and this is in some ways part of my critique, both about Jesus and John Wayne. And I'm only in the first chapter of Megan Basham's book, so I'm not going to by any means try to give a review of it. But the thing that annoyed me about Jesus and John Wayne, where they're always using labels that sort of set up the kind of in-group in group talk, you know, all, and Jesus and John Wayne, oh, we, we, and then, you know, maybe people who embrace these, we on the left, or we progressives, or we liberals, and then it's all of those conservatives and fundamentalists and people on the right, and and, and that mode of talking, and church, pastors do it all the time, preachers do it all the time, we here in church are right and good, and it's those people out there, so it's all the in-group, out-group stuff, and I, I don't, when, when a book reads like that, even if there's like really good information in the book, and even if I don't, I'm very interested in the premise, and I'm, I'm fully prepared to be convinced that, you know, as that even, and actually Kale and Mo and, and Sam talked about it a little bit in this video too, that it, it's totally true that that we human beings are, are totally susceptible to subtle ways of of influencing us and moving us closer. All the cool kids are believing this. All the cool kids are believing that. Right from the start of this channel, I've said people believe what what the community that is around them believe. They they the people that they look up to they will mirror those beliefs. That's how human beings develop beliefs. And of course. Um, I don't know if this hat's going to work. Uh, I had to turn off this fan because it was blowing. And, you know, I know there's sensitive ears. Rick showed me a plug-in with, with vMix that maybe I can do something like that and uh, have better sound. I don't know. But let, let's go back and let's listen to more of this, um, more of this podcast because it's quite good. I think you and I are driven by a similar interest in the meta conversation around these topics. Like, I'm not particularly animated by any one particular cultural issue but I am interested in the meta narrative around these issues. In preparation for our conversation today, I otherwise wouldn't do this because it would be like torturing myself. And, and this, I think this is a big piece of, of the online conversations, the TLC that we are having too. In fact, later in this, later in this, she's going to talk about these unspeakeasy retreats that she does she does eight of them a year and they seem identical to this thing that i did at my sister's place back in 2019 and i'm planning another one in february it's details of that to come um and it's going to be a super small group 12 to 16 people and it's going to be probably thursday friday saturday because saturday afternoon i'm going to want to take a break and i'm going to want to go to my my mother's church with her and you know i don't know maybe maybe the um maybe the whitensville people want to do an estuary thing sunday night or something like that but I, when i listen to megan dom and i listen to what she's doing 
I thought this is very similar to Estuary, but she doesn't really have TLC going. It seems like, and her community is like all women. We've got to like all these dudes, but I think she's got more. I, I think hers is like upscale. I think we're, I think we're much more diverse socioeconomically than she is. But I, I just saw that you know a little while ago, Chad. Chad was going out there looking for other flotillas and he found the House of Bad Influence. And, and I think actually, if you're looking for another flotilla that is really a lot like ours, but like secular, she's got like no religious things going at all. That would all be around, um, that would all be around Megan Dom because the, the dynamics and when she talks in this video about why people like the in-person things and and again they they've got like eight of those conferences a year or retreats a year and they're super small now we're doing bigger conferences but in their little small things she has speakers and so it's a little bit different i should probably i do i could probably make a connection um i know somebody who knows somebody i should probably make a connection and have a conversation because my guess is she has no idea what we're doing but it's, of course, she's been a journalist, so, you know, she's got books out there in her name, and so she's got much more visibility sort of in the, in the older, um, in the, basically in the, in the mass media. Torturing myself, but I went on Reddit and just like typed in your name. Oh God. Oh my God. I have never done that. I mean, literally like my eyes would burn out. And wanted to see what people on Reddit were saying they were writing that you were either conservative or far right and just didn't know it. And to me, one, I don't think that's accurate, but two, that's what I'm interested in, specifically how someone can listen to someone like you who grapples with issues, who can have her mind changed, who might have a strong opinion about something, but a strong opinion potentially loosely held and you're open to reason. How someone can read an essay by you or listen to a podcast and then their takeaway from that is, oh, she's hard right. I'm interested in that. What happens in our minds collectively when we interpret reality in such a way where a heterodox quote unquote voice comes through their ears and is filtered out the other end as neo-Nazi? Now, it was interesting because I haven't had a chance to watch this yet, but he sort of came out the same way. A fundamentalist by someone who's this video is on a controversial topic. I think it'll be a, a little bit of a controversial video, unfortunately, though I hope it's helpful. But it's necessary for us to talk about these things happening in the church today. I want to share my heart more than I ever have before in a Truth Unites video about what we're seeing in the church today. Here's how I'll introduce it. Have you ever been called a fundamentalist by someone who's actually just a notch to the left of you? Or what about this? Someone who's just, just a smidge to the right of you um, on a couple of issues or just one issue concludes that you're a liberal. Seems like this is happening a lot these days and a lot more. The, the overuse of these uh, more extreme labels and categories. Many of us are called both from different angles and that seems to be happening a lot. I've been thinking about this a lot, this proliferation of these labels ever since I put up my responses to Megan Basham's book Shepherds for Sale a few weeks back and just seeing the various reactions to that. And, and the book itself made me more reflective about the broader moment we in uh, broader moment we're in as a church. More on, on that book uh, at the end of this video. Now, that's basically the same issue that's going on here, and it's basically the same issue that sort of the IDW gets a mention here. I don't even want to parse this anymore. Like I'm losing patience. Hard right, far right. There's no meaning to that. If they want to call me a conservative at this point, okay, fine, maybe I am. I don't know how you define that anymore. Right, the definitions of words have gotten blown up. And you know, it makes me think of one of the essays of yours that I read recently, speaking of something you said earlier about not having particularly strong opinions. Maybe you don't have strong enough opinions to be canceled, but you could say you have strong enough opinions to be problematized. Yes. There was an essay you wrote called, I wasn't canceled, I was problematized, in which you say, quote. And I love that phrase because when I think Probably in the CRC, I've been problematized by my old by my old faction. Um, I, I, I suspect nobody's come out and said anything, but I think I've been problematized. You say, quote, ever since the publication of my last book, which was for our listeners, the problem with everything, 
highly recommend, which made an honest appraisal of the culture war. I've been somewhat non grata in certain literary circles. There's nothing too special about this since it's a pattern that has played out for all kinds of people in all kinds of milieus since the Trump election. The exact opinions and observations that had made me the toast of the town in 2015 were getting me removed from guest lists little more than a year later, end quote. Like that sentence right there. It's like, you didn't change, but for some reason in the course of 12 months, you went from being the toast of the town in certain literary circles to being like in hushed tones, maybe we shouldn't invite Megan to the party anymore. Now, I, I, in, in all fairness, I've never been the toast of the town. And it's just a very weird thing to see. Yeah, and the thing is, you think you're crazy. Right, yeah. There's no way to prove that it's happening. Right. So maybe I'm just, I'm imagining this, you know, it's like, God, get over yourself. They're not thinking about you. Maybe they just forgot to invite you. Or, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons. You're like, you're getting older. There's a lot of reasons that somebody stops being the toast of the town. It's really hard to know. So the idea that I'm a conservative and I just don't know it, Somebody could have said that about me 20 years ago. I mean, there's nothing that I have written in the last eight years that I wasn't writing for 16 years in the Los Angeles Times. I was an opinion columnist. I said all kinds of things. And often they couldn't tell if I was on the left or the right. I mean, I was clearly not. I didn't like George W. Bush and all that kind of stuff. But it was completely fine. That was the job. You were supposed to look at issues and at the culture in an honest Now. This opinion columnist thing, all the way back to um, Elizabeth Oldfield's conversation, I should play that because sometimes people ask, well, how do you choose the topics for your video? I choose the topics for my video from the things that get stuck in my head and my consciousness, and I just start fixating on them. I keep coming back to them. I said, there's something there. There's something there. There's something there. You... I'm always fascinated by the way this language is slippery. And when we use phrases like liberal or conservative, we have such different associations with them. So I'd love if you don't mind to just say kind of, what are your deep political principles? Whatever label they end up, whatever box they end up in. The principles, they're just, they're, they're just practical desires. I think that it's necessary in a, in particularly in, in an advanced and wealthy society for the state to intervene sometime. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, the principle is seeded by the most, uh, any, all but the most completely barking libertarians. Uh, in, in the, whenever people say, well, what about nationalization and states running away? Well, do you think that the Royal Navy should be run as a private concern? And of course they don't. There are some who do. There are some who think it should be contracted out to privateers, but I think we can we can reasonably lay them aside as serious players in the political battle. There are things which the state does better. Uh, the, and that's one of them. A railways is another, in my view. But the, so you, to me, there's no, there's no great sort of hierarchy and moral force. It's just you can't, don't dare nationalize anything. Yeah. Uh, I'll nationalize some things and not nationalize others. I, it's, it's wholly pragmatic to me because I, because I do think that, the, 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 that a lot of people are, are weak and damaged and afraid and they need some help. And uh, an organized uh, state under law is quite a good way of providing it. So. Mm. But with a... Well, do you... The language of social conservatism, a sense of... Actually, individual moral choices are not the highest good. That there's, there's, there are other things at play. Oh, it's, it's the highest good. I'm not. <laughs> sorry, the, the, I don't have a highest good in politics. The highest good is in, is in eternity. You mustn't mix up the two. And Quinton Hogg is very good about this. You, you, there is absolutely no reason to believe that somebody, because he is a Christian, must be a conservative or yeah. must be a socialist. Yeah, uh, it's perfectly possible to be to be a Christian and to be either of uh, either of those. It's a different interpretation. Yeah, uh, and and that, that's one of the reasons why civilized discourse between opponents is is so important. Nobody is right all the time. Yes, and um, I'd love. I often ask guys because I interview people from radically different principles, perspectives, religious positions, and I often ask them, "What is the one thing you wish people understood?" but they don't seem to. You said to me on Twitter that you're constantly trying to explain to people why you hold views they don't expect you to hold. What's... I don't think I can narrow it down to one thing. I'm afraid there are so many. Okay, and so people if... don't. Well, the, the main thing people have to understand is that, it, 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 is, that, it, is that almost certainly the opinions they hold 
uh, are not their own opinions. Mm. Uh, and the, the great Jonathan Swift's uh, law, you cannot reason a man out of a position he wasn't reasoned into in the first place. I, I know this. Yeah. I've tried. You can't do it. And not many people have. How do you think people come to their opinions? They pick them up. They pick them up. Less and less from their parents, more and more from... Uh, certainly in, in, in the years when I was growing up from television, as the national sense of humour, which is now almost completely uniform, uh, was provided by television, as far as I can see. Right. I, I don't actually find a lot of it particularly funny, but but they do, and there you are. Um, uh, the, it's, it's been a hugely conformist force in, in all the opinions that people hold about practically anything. Mm. And, and that's now that's just now moved on to, to antisocial media. Yeah, good phrase. Do you... I mean, one of the places people get their opinions from is, is columnists. Do you see that? No, they don't. Of, yeah. OK. Uh, they go to columnists to, for reassurance about the opinions they already hold. Right. I think there are very few people who go to columnists to try and, and, to, to, to try and learn from somebody who disagrees with them. I just don't think... That's that's what I do as a columnist. I People go to columnists and to YouTube to get reassurance about the positions they already hold. And they certainly go to church for that. I mean, church, I, I was thinking the other day, I was explaining to someone kind of the, the difficulty of, of... Part of the reason when I was in seminary, I did not want to be a local church pastor was because I knew that I would get bored making sermons because, well, there's, there's, this, there's this dual trap. One is everybody wants to hear what they're expecting to hear, and they're going to be bored because they're only hearing what they expect to hear. So what you have to do is you have to find some new thing to reinforce the old thing. And that's sort of how to keep a church group happy. Because a big part of the reason for the church is they want to maintain what they already believe and they want to be validated and vindicated in those beliefs. Now, there's there's a great portion in the Purgatory video with, with uh, Roland and Peugeot where I'm, I'm going to have to just, I'm going to have to keep going through that video because there's so much good stuff in that video. And, and Richard has made it possible for me to listen to his Purgatory class. So which is on one hand a tremendous gift because I really want to hear it. On the other hand, it's 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 such a challenge for me because the behind the paywall stuff is a real problem because once I hear something really excited, I like to share it and I can't share it. But uh, I'm list, you know, I listen to I've 10 th I find for every one thing I'm actually able to share on this channel, I find 10 things that I'm really excited about and never get to share. And one of these days I'm going to crack that nut. And I'm going to flood this channel. I'm going to put 10 videos out a day. And that'll never happen. But anyway, but, but that point is so important. And when I look at the YouTube algorithms and the Twitter algorithms, and today I had to, I had to do something. And so I, I, I wandered onto Facebook, which I really work hard to avoid, to never go to Facebook. And then there are hundreds of of DMs in Facebook that people have tried to message me and I feel really bad about it because I just can't bear to open up Facebook because it's just it's just so awful. And Facebook is just like plunging into these wells of cheap confirmation and validation. And, and to me, it's all built on insecurity. Here, I've picked up this belief and I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. So please let me find someone out there who's going to believe like I do. And gosh, there's there. Th this is a deep, deep thing. And right now, the way our societies are constituted and the role of great phrase on social media this is a huge deal. All right, back to the Megan Dom thing. Not. I didn't like George W. Bush and all that kind of stuff, but it was completely fine. That was the job. You were supposed to look at issues and at the culture in an honest and surprising way and invite people to think about things differently. So if that's conservative, to me, that's the opposite of conservative. And again, in church, you're supposed to look at things that they've kind of, they probably don't know it because... 
the even even in a Protestant church, even in an evangelical church, where quite frankly, sorry, Catholic and Orthodox, the rate of biblical literacy in biblicist Protestant churches is way higher than in all the other traditions. It just is. Now, I know that you've got some Catholics and Orthodox who really know their Bible well, but in terms of a Christian tradition that is popularized, just whether or not they've got perspective on the Bible, whether or not they've got interpretation of the Bible, but that they, they, they at least have Bible knowledge, evangelicals, they do that well. One would think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wonder how much of it is just, it becomes mimetic and then it's just tribal and group identification. Yeah. I recently had Dr. Alina Chan back on the show to talk about her recent New York Times piece in which she discusses the high probability that COVID came from a lab in Wuhan, something that Jon Stewart was joking about several years. Sorry for the interruption. Freddie came by. I had to do a Freddie and Paul show, so uh, we'll continue. Oh, to talk about her recent New York Times piece in which she discusses the high probability that COVID came from a lab in Wuhan, something that Jon Stewart was joking about several years ago. Yes, before he got the memo that he shouldn't do that. Before he was problematized. Right. But Alina was describing something similar in what should be a non-political space where once a majority of people within the scientific community decided that there was a right and wrong answer for where COVID-19 came from, everyone who did not have the correct opinion was demonized, was problematized. It just seems to be something that is infecting all spaces in terms of, oh, you're not just someone who has a different opinion from me. You're a bad person. Well, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Like instead of areas of study or expertise, we have communities. So instead of science, we have the scientific community. Instead of literature, we have the literary community. Instead of black people in all their multitudes of politics and diversity of thought, there's the black community. What does that mean? Nothing. Yeah, it's a kind of bullying tactic. It's a kind of way to make someone believe. Now, this was another one of those pieces that just sort of stuck when she said that. And and a little bit earlier, I was I was getting my drink. Let's 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 back it up a little bit. And see if I can find it again. I mean, I wonder how much of it is just it becomes mimetic and then it's just tribal and group identification. Yeah. I recently had Dr. Alina Chan back on the show to talk about her recent New York Times piece in which she discusses the high probability that COVID came from a lab in Wuhan, something that Jon Stewart was joking about several years ago. Yes, before he got the memo that he shouldn't do that. Before he was problematized. Right. But Alina was describing something similar in what should be a non-political space where once a majority of people within the science... Okay. I don't think we can ever have a non-political space. There will always be politics. And I think this... I think this way of thinking about it, which is that, well, there's, you know, we have all these little choosers and there should be rationality. And this is, I mean, again, this is, this is sort of part of the paradigm that is receding. So there will always be a political space. And so instead of thinking that we're going to have a non-political space, we should think about the fact that, in fact, we will do collective cognition. And that's what we're doing. And the politics is part of it. And so on one hand, it's... All right, it's fair enough. We're going to we're going to be canceling people and problematizing people and we're going to do all of that and we're going to be using these labels, the labels that I started out this video so I'm kind of complaining about it. I mean, I can complain about it, but the complaining about it is part of the process as well. And and, and that's something where there, there's no sort of getting outside of it. Now again, fortunately, we're we're hopefully maintaining, and this is where we're not exactly post-liberal, we're hopefully maintaining certain boundaries. And, and I think the, the helpful thing is to understand the tribes as sort of collective cognition. And, and then you have participation in a tribe, but part of what's happening is, you know, we've been picking up various ideas, our ideas have been picking us, and we've been working through this. And but then what she said is, I think, correct also, even though I just sort of said, um, yeah, we're going to do this sort of as collective cognition and, and it isn't going to be just individuals with us talking. And I think, again, this is a big piece of what we're doing with live streams. And I just jumped into the Bridges of Meaning. They had a, they had a big uh, voice chat going on today and I jumped into that. I didn't say too much. I only had a few minutes between 
going and having to do something and yada yada, yada with everything I have to do. Part of me, <laughs> ah, 2017, I remember the days before I had a YouTube channel and I just had a quiet dying church and I had a few things I needed to prepare and I had time to read and I had time to and then and then I found YouTube and I had time to talk and now it's like I don't feel like I have time for anything I want to do no that's not true I, I don't have as much time for the things that I really enjoy doing but and but then I think what what Megan Dom says here is is very very important scientific community decided that there was a right and wrong answer for where COVID-19 came from. Every and, and again, part of, you know, to bring in Luke Thompson and, and how Luke sort of really annoys, Luke sort of kind of goes after um, propositionalism or propositional tyranny. There is a right answer where COVID-19 came from. Personally, I suspect came from a lab. But truth be told, what do I know? Really? What do I know about it? Not a heck of a lot. And so, and for the vast majority of people I talk to, what do they know about it? Not a heck of a lot. And that's where you get sort of the expert dynamic where on one hand, yeah, okay, some people know more than others. But among even people who know a lot with very hard questions, they still don't know. And, and again, you, you sort of imagine, okay, we're all going to slip into this abyss of skepticism, but you can't really live falling into that abyss of skepticism. So we're all trying to work on this stuff and we're all doing it via teams and tribes. And But then I think Megan Dom is exactly right here that when, when, you, when you start talking about the such and such community, well, that's just fudging. That is that is just plain fudging. Everyone who did not have the correct opinion was demonized, was problematized. It just seems to be something that is infecting all spaces in terms of, oh, you're not just someone who has a different opinion from me. And again, it's infecting all spaces. But then they get to, you know, good person, bad person. And those who've been around a long time know that whenever I hear someone talking about a good person or a bad person, part of it is just sort of the... the perennial binary that consciousness sort of monofocality of consciousness or awareness sort of provokes these binaries you know choose a b choosing so good person or bad person but these these things mean nothing if you see adolf hitler petting a cat you might say oh what a lovely man he's petting a cat also exterminating millions of people or you might say joseph stalin or chairman mao or or you know the neighbor next door that is letting that lets their dog do his business in your yard. I mean, whatever, whatever your whoever your enemy is, good person, bad person. That's just as fudgy as the whole rest of the business. You're a bad person. Well, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Like instead of areas of study or expertise, we have communities. So instead of science, we have the scientific community. Instead of literature, we have the literary community. And, and again, so Megan is still a little bit more in the modernist language space than, than I would be comfortable. But there is something to people who actually know a little something about that. And there is such a thing as expertise. It's just, just like you get the whole community speak thing is sort of a form of bullying. Is it really bullying or is that a little too far? It's sort of a form of influence, perhaps a little... Coercion. I really have to find this video that Karen Wong pointed me to. Um, I, I listened to a little bit of it and thought, oh, this sounds good. And then I never got back to it. And I don't think I put it on my blog, so I don't know if I can find it as easily. But we should just have a tremendous amount more nuance in this. Because, again, part of, part of how modernity and its scientism operates is it tries to radically reduce the variables to bring things down into really simple binaries. And and once you have a binary, then you can choose. But life is seldom that simple. Instead of black people in all their multitudes of politics and diversity of thought, there's the black community. What does that mean? Nothing. Yeah, it's a kind of bullying tactic. It's a kind of way to make someone believe or at least say they believe the same thing that you do under threat of expulsion or excommunication. In that same essay, you wrote, quote, And now look at the language he used, excommunication. So 
again, we have to see that in many ways we are all downstream from the church here. And, and part of what I noticed when all of this stuff, at least when I was seeing a lot of it in 2016, 2017, 2018, was that I didn't necessarily feel myself like a fish out of water in this thing because you're always swimming in those things if you're actually participating in real religious communities. And I think, quite frankly, part of the reason people have over the last number of years resisted organized religion is this is precisely the dynamic they want to avoid. And so then they go into some kind of religious space that has no institutions. But then you begin to discover that, well, then some of the benefits of institutions, which are considerable and can be at times, are also no longer available, not only to you and your enjoyment, but in terms of the ability to create community and maintain community and bring community into the future and your ability to sort of work through information and knowledge. Because the truth is, we must, in fact, practice collective cognition because we our lifetimes are way too short. We simply have to trust other people to outsource whole realms of cognition, to listen to someone and believe them. And again, part of the beauty of modernity was that there are all sorts of ways that we could do this well. And in many ways, what we're sort of doing is seeing the edges of modernity. And that's why, you know, it's, it's, we, if you, if you're walking past the edges of something, it certainly feels in terms of perspective, like a recession. You can travel back into it, but once you're sort of outside of it and you begin to realize its limitations, it's like, well, yeah, limited. Quote, and this stood out to me. I hadn't seen this from you before. And maybe you've written about it elsewhere and I just missed it. But you said, quote, speaking of yourself, or maybe you should just publish another book already. After all, it's been a few years. With all that extra time on your hands, you'd think you could have written a couple hundred continuous pages and slapped them between two covers, as long as it wasn't about the culture wars, which is the only thing you're interested in. And maybe you should examine that, end quote. And we've spoken a bit off mic about my own journey, even on this episode with culture war related topics and this podcast, how I used to cover them a little bit more uh, and how I cover them less now. And to be fair to you, Megan, when I say we've spoken about, I mean, I've vented to you and you've very generously listened to me. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Uh, anytime. <laughs> Thank you. But the Cliff's Notes version of how I came to my decision to move away from these topics, I still like having these conversations. We're talking about it right now. But not every episode. And I think one of the reasons why is because talking about these insanities and mobbings and hypocrisies and all that stuff, which is very real, but it was it was like making me ill, like it was making me sad and like almost physically unwell. Like I got to this point where I'd start prepping for these episodes and I would begin to start to dread them because I'd be like, oh, I have to wade back into the radioactive pool of waste in order to like prep myself for this episode, even though those topics do worry me. Do you ever get a similar feeling in your gut when you think about these things and you talk about them on a weekly basis on your podcast? What keeps you here? Like what keeps you in the space? If I want to keep doing the podcast, I have to keep talking about this stuff. There's two things that make a podcast. This part is so interesting. And I disagree with her to a degree, but I understand her point. Work. You're either super, super specific like, this is a podcast about this particular kind of embroidery. True crime. Yes. Not even true crime, but like this particular genre of true <laughs> crime. Like, really, really deep and narrow. Okay, so you can do that. Or you can lean really hard into politics or culture wars. And you can say the stuff that people are expecting you to say. I mean, that's the thing that, um, you know, I've really learned from... Okay, and this is where it's sort of, again, like church, because preaching or a religious, a religious audience in a podcast, and again, I look at Christian YouTube and how it functions, and, well, here's, here's sort of your little space to stay in. You'd better stay in that box or you're going to lose your audience. And you could say, well, congregations were the first audience capture. But, but you don't want to sort of go off into the other side and say, well, pastors should be sort of like freewheeling individuals who, who go off into the frontier. And the truth is, pastors do do that sometimes, and they usually wind up going alone. Because even though audience capture can be a very difficult thing, 
we are smarter together. And again, sort of what churches and religious communities should do, and when I talk about religious communities, I mean not just the black community or the gay community or one of these sort of fabricated communities for rhetorical argument's sake. I mean, an actual community in which people know each other and they know each other's names and they have reputations and they have not just knowledge about where they stand on a propositional landscape, but they actually have been over to their house and they've eaten their cooking and they, they know what sports teams they like, et cetera, et cetera. In a community like that, we need that. Because again, back to the Jordan Peterson sanity conversation, sanity is maintained by communities. It really is. And, but, but those communities also limit the, the scope of our beliefs. And, you know, I might believe that, um, oh, I don't know. In, in a sense, again, and I've, I've said this all the way from the start, your beliefs are always in conversation and to a degree alignment with the community that you participate in. That's where influence matters. And so... The truth is that if you believe along with your community, if at least a few hundred or, or several thousand or even a few million people are at least enough on a same page that you can actually exist, well, that's pretty good. But of course, these ideas get very large and you exist over periods of time. And then, of course, some communities fall off the map and they go away. And, and, and the truth is that communities do and don't go away. And we've had enormous change over time. When I think about what my grandparents believed compared to what my parents believe, compared to what I believe, wow. You know, in, in some ways, all of us are sort of in this Dutch Calvinist um, pot with respect to certain beliefs, or at least not all members of my family, but, and then but then there's all kinds of other things, and you have all of the disruption by technology, and all of the disruption of history, and so this business about community and believing is, is deeply, deeply important, and, and part of what's happening now, again, is we're managing our belief communities through these social medias and through the algorithms that maintain them. Now doing the show with Sarah, because, you know, The Unspeakable is an interview show. It's just me and a guest, and I have all kinds of different guests. And then Sarah, it's just the two of us talking. I mean, you probably know this from your own research. Audiences really like the chat shows. They want to know what they're getting every single episode. They don't want to be surprised. And so if you have guests... Again... That is so much a church. Churches don't really like that. There's they like a little bit of surprise because they want a little bit of novelty. But if you walk, if I walk up one day and say, you know what, I've decided, I'm going to start a new cult of the holy squirrel. Uh, yeah, um, that won't go well, even at Little Living Stones. In fact, I don't think anybody at Living Stones would follow me into the cult of the Holy Squirrel. And rightly so. And because we're in a real community, they'd say, now, Paul, this 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 squirrel thing, I, 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 maybe, maybe pull back off the squirrel thing. And let's talk about that. That's what communities do. They, they actually help us regulate our sanity. Guests... They're really only going to listen if they're interested in that guest. Now, other than your base, there's a core audience that trusts me. That If I have a guest, they know that I have a good reason for it and they'll listen. But by and large, they're not going to listen. So I do it to the extent that I do it because I want to keep the show afloat. But I actually don't do it as much as you might think. And I certainly want to do less of it. But I've had to kind of taper. Don't do what as much? I don't want to do as much culture war stuff. Mm. But, you know, it's kind of like if you want to have that literary author on, you better make sure that you've got two culture war conversations that month so you don't lose subscribers. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. You and this is fascinating because, of course, she's right to a degree. And also, she, a little bit later, she's going to talk about the fact that, well, the only way you're really going to find a new audience is YouTube because that's sort of the best way. Maybe now through Twitter, Elon's trying to get into that space. 
maybe through Facebook, but you need, uh, YouTube has a high degree of discovery. But again, you tend to discover what the algorithm says, well, you've watched a whole bunch of this. Now, you, now, you know, maybe you'll like this. You become almost a, a prisoner of your own show. That is what audience capture is. Mm. But I do not consider myself to have audience capture because my audience isn't big enough, quite honestly. But yeah, I do keep doing it, and I uh, I wish I did less of it. But <laughs> I think that this I think that people would stop listening to the podcast, unfortunately. Yeah, you recently tweeted, posted. I don't know what they're called anymore since Elon changed. I xed. You recently you recently xed something related. You said, "quote The longer I stay in the podcasting space." The more I want to disappear into the woods and write novels, but being a podcaster has alienated much of the literary community, so I'm screwed, end quote. And then you followed that up later with, quote, I get exasperated with the heretic podcast space because, well, it can be exasperating, end quote. Is that what you're talking about here or did you mean something else by that? Yeah, that is kind of what I'm talking about. I can only compete with the uh, edgy McEdgelord for so long. <laughs> You should title the podcast that. It'd probably get four times the views. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the people who are succeeding in this space, that's another term I hate, the space. It's like the community. <laughs> <laughs> when you get kicked out of your community, then you're going to go fund your space. And I, that's just right. She's exactly right. And I hope it's a safe one. Yeah. You just see these people just hitting this stuff over and over again. Like, let's talk for the millionth time about how men are not women and look at these crazy people who say that they're the opposite sex or gender or whatever. It's like, yeah, we know. We got it. We got it. I got it. I understand. And also, if I'm, I'm going to steel man why people, and I'm not lumping you in here, but if I can steel man why I think some people look at podcasts like that and look at the guests, right? There's a specific podcast I'm thinking of. The hosts repeatedly say that they are centrists or center left even though a lot of people keep telling them, we think you're conservative. And if you look at guest after guest of their show and thumbnail and title, if you didn't know any better, just from the title and the thumbnail and all that stuff, you would think, okay, they seem rather obsessed with the same four or five culture war topics, and they're all kind of pointing the same direction, and that direction isn't to the left. And I do wonder, in the same way that I... Th uh, um I, I, I'm not sure. Again, this right-left thing, it is so broken. But, yeah, it, it's just so hard to talk about this stuff. But what's interesting is that I wonder, I mean, churches had a degree of tradition that sort of kept them in bounds. And what we have sort of happening on on unsocial media is just just things are just getting i got back from europe and i opened up a browser with youtube in it and i thought the world is nuts it's insane and this will make you crazy this this will make you nuts and i think there are people who want to get into politics right mr smith goes to washington style and they want to change washington and then they get elected and then they spend a little bit of time in washington they get reelected a couple times and all of a sudden they kind of morph even though they might have had good intentions into that same kind of corrupt or semi corrupt washington dc politician well and this is of course formation we are all formed by the community that we are in. And so if you go to Washington, you will be formed by Washington. And Washington is formed by the nation. And and very real dynamics that are out there will form. But yet it's always evolving. And so new things will evolve. And, you know, I don't know why we're surprised by this. I think part of it is, is a, a defective anthropology about human nature that we don't understand that we eventually are shaped and molded by the people we spend our time around and especially those that we look up to that we see over and over again and so i wonder do you think there's something about entering the quote-unquote heterodox podcasting space where a lot of these creators will start with the same intention of i want to think uniquely about these topics i want to have guests on from right and left and everywhere in between and then for whatever reason they just either pull themselves or get pulled to the right. Like I've seen this play out six times with six different major podcasts. Why does it keep happening? Because they're succeeding. 
Because they're making money. Audience capture. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea who you're... And, and this, of course, is in very many ways the same question as shepherds for sale. Um, there is... We are all moved by and influenced by... And again, to me, the the at least I've just started the book. Now I've got a funeral I've got to go to that's a little ways out of town tomorrow. So I'm going to have some more time in the car and I hope to listen to more Shepherds for Sale and listen to some other things. But it should come as no surprise. This is how we are. You're talking about, but <laughs> in some cases... You end up with a really nice studio and you've got a lot of great production stuff and you've got money coming in, not just from your paying subscribers, but from all kinds of funding sources and you've got ads and now you're being flown around and you can do these amazing interviews and you can fly to them and you've got just big budgets and that is only going to work if you give the audience what they need. I mean, this is just how the markets work. If you're in the... In other words, there are many things to be captured by you can be captured by some political action committee or whatever their real name is who um okay you've got some influence and so let me influence you and you know again and i'm big enough to have been flown well i get flown out to these little tlc conferences that we do and um flown out to england that was cool and, um, well, that was also the um, breakwater. So, I mean, it's it's just, and, and so I think about this. I, I really think about this. And when I talk about, when I talk about growth and it's like, yeah, if a million people found it, I think it'd be like, ooh, I'm, 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 I'm really not so sad it's small. And to me, it's, I mean, to me, it's small. Um, I was looking at the analytics today and my analytics this week have kind of been the, like the analytics were three years ago. So it's like, well, maybe I've shrunk. Um, that's not entirely a bad thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. And so I just sort of say to the Lord, I say, okay, Lord, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put this in your lap. <laughs> And I know Jacob will always complain, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. And that doesn't mean I'm not intentional about things and don't think about things and don't have tactics and strategy and those things. But I, there are, if you gained the whole world but lost your soul, I mean, there's a reason that saying is out there. The entertainment industry is exactly the same thing. If your show does well, if it does well with audiences, it's going to get renewed and you're going to write stories a certain way. And that is how things work. I don't think that podcasters, independent creators are not above any of these same market dictates. That's life in the big city. That's showbiz, folks. <laughs> so it's frustrating. I get it. But we are seeing this in people who succeed. The ones that are making money I'm sure there are exceptions, but it's really hard to do. If you want to have a range of guests and not hit any one thing too hard, it's really not going to work. My show has a smaller audience than it did, I'd say, a year ago. It has not grown in the last several years. You know, I've tried different things over the years. It's had many permutations. I was on podcast one for a while. I've tried different things with ads. Like I've tried every possible way to grow the audience, to make money. I shouldn't say I did every possible thing. I never manipulated my guests and I never manipulated the content in order to try to make money. It was just sort of different platforms and different paywall kind of structures and that kind of thing. But no, now what I do is most of the episodes are paywalled and my paid subscribers are growing. The show's making more money, but the audience is shrinking. And I've just made peace with that. It's the thousand true fans approach. Yes. The idea that you don't have to have a huge audience as long as you have a very loyal one who's willing to pay for it. Yeah. And so that's good. You know, I don't get invited. Then again, it also means that you've just sort of created your own little hive mind. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but part of part of what I think modernity got right is, and, and I think McGilchrist is right on this too, part of the brain is the emissary is sort of looking down and using the hand, but the other is keeping an eye out. And you want to be doing both. 
you need to be doing both. And so no, I, I was I found her I found her honesty refreshing. Okay? I found it refreshing. And you know, I've been fortunate in that this um what I do here is not my day job, which is why, you know, I've got to stop and help Freddie with something. And tomorrow I drive down to a funeral and, 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 and. But frankly, I sort of like it that way because living with these screens and living with the talk and yada, 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 go to a funeral and it's like, hmm, yeah, that's that, that sort of, you know, sobers everyone up that's why i think funerals are super healthy things everybody you sort of have to stop and you sort of have to ask yourself okay what's really important that's where we get to these eulogy virtues what's really important what's we, we lose sight of our value hierarchies and what 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 really when it's all said and done should we be navigating towards I did to big conferences and stuff like that. There's still a lot of people who have no idea who I am, but okay. I don't know. I can't speak for you, but if the cost of admission to that is what you've described is selling your soul and selling out and leaning in to all that culture war BS to such an extreme degree that you're basically just feeding chum to people who want to be fed chum all the time. Is it worth it? You get flown to all these places. And, and that's and that's such a vivid image, feeding chum to people who want to be fed chum. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, I get messages from people who are sometimes just, they're going out of their mind. And I just say, just turn off the computer, put away the smartphone, go talk to your neighbor, go to church, talk to people who don't do any of this. And this is part of Vendonk's um, point about the TLC, which is go to an estuary meeting. And again, oh, wow. Sunday mornings, our estuary meetings, they're just so good. They're so honest. There's no recording. Um, most of the people in there, they don't watch me during the week. They just see me on weekends preaching. Maybe uh, some of them see me during the week, so some there's some overflow between the TLC and Estuary, but it, it's a really healthy one in my little group, I think. And the, the conversations are are so good, and I always learn so much, and I find it I find it so nourishing. Um, it's it's, but again, it's it's in person and it's real. This is you get to speak at the Oxford Union. But what's the price? Well, that kind of thing bothers some people less than other people. It bothers me, I think, because I'm older. So I talk about this with Sarah Hader all the time. So we do our podcast on video, on YouTube. The other thing is, if you have a podcast, your discoverability is going to be basically zero unless you're on YouTube. Most people find their content on YouTube, especially anybody under 30. That's the main way they take in media. So we have to do cameras. We got to have the cameras on, all that stuff. And then we have to make those god-awful thumbnails that you were just <laughs> referring to, right? There's a particular style. It's the cutout silhouette head figure making some kind of exact... I found this so refreshing because, you know, and, and every, you know, so many do it. I mean, I, I poked fun at, at Ruslan... Um, and, and when I, when I met him at ARC, oh, Mark is live streaming. I, I kind of want to, kind of want to jump on or, um, I, I kind of poked fun at Ruslan because, you know, the, oh, come on. Yeah. And then the videos, I mean, and, and when I, <laughs> you've, and you got Ruslan and, and then when I, I joked to him about, it, he says, yeah, there's just, you know. The guys who the guys who make my videos they make the thumbnails and but but you know um, I mean you look at look at Gavin's thumbnails and 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 that's how that's a thumbnail that sells you, you, you want to know thumbnails that don't sell. 
These don't. They, they, you know, and sometimes I play around with AI and um, the reason I do a lot of these thumbnails, that one, I knew that one would get some attention. Um, um, but the reason I play around with AI and the reason I actually try to put a lot of the faces of the people that are in the video or the book covers, the reason I put them on there is because often if I want to find something in the past, and usually it's just a link in there, I know what's in the video because it's on the thumbnail. I try to do something that's at least a little interesting and engaging, but no, she's, she's right. She's exactly right. Exaggerated facial expression, like, oh my God, I can't believe what I, you know, it's either like, I'm so shocked or I'm so angry. I'm, you're, you're owning the other side, you know, so you've got that screaming text. You've got the exaggerated facial expressions. It is so trashy. I cannot stand it. And I have asked many, many people, I said, why is it against the law to have your thumbnails look any way other than this? Every single thumbnail on YouTube looks like this. And there is just some sort of algorithmic reality that you have to do that. It's the Mr. Beastification of YouTube. Yeah, which, and I have never actually seen Mr. Beast, but yes. You've seen his thumbnails. That is what I have heard. <laughs> yeah, so I really hate it and I don't do it for the unspeakable. And that's another reason that I don't have that many listeners. And again, part of the reason I, I don't do it is because I want my podcast to be the kind of thing that you could send to your nice liberal NPR listening friend and say, hey, you might really enjoy this. Why don't you give it a listen? And if it's got a screaming thumbnail attached to it, that person's going to be turned off. And I still care about that. See, but the difference is I think a lot of people like Sarah, who's 20, more than 20 years younger than me, she's like, why do you care about that? Who cares? Who cares what some boomer NPR listener thinks? Why are you getting hung up on this? Speaking of communities, and I want to take this kind of back to where you started, which was as a writer. Let's talk about the literary community today. Specifically, can you tell us a bit about the idea of literary citizenship? Okay, so... It's a, it's a great podcast, and I'll put the link below. You should definitely listen to it. And there was, well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just do the whole thing. Being back and letting the Yasha monks of the world lead the way. I think that just sort of temperamentally, I'm not a natural leader, end quote. I have no memory of saying that. Okay. And then a year later, you founded the Unspeakeasy, which I'd love to talk with you about. So what happened in that year that changed your mind and specifically changed how you viewed yourself? Oh, July 2021. Think about what I was doing. I really like the idea of getting people together in, in person and talking unmediated, off the record, not recorded, all that kind of stuff. No screens. So, yeah, I, I guess, yes, I did have some kind of vague idea that I wanted to start some kind of nuance movement. And then I saw things like Persuasion starting and, ver and various communities, communities, listener communities around podcasts, that kind of thing. It's funny, actually, part of the reason I got the idea from the Unspeakeasy was because I went to a Yasha Monk. I went to a Persuasion Zoom hangout. The Unspeakeasy, obviously, it's a, named after the Unspeakable podcast, which was named after my book, The Unspeakable, which came out in 2014. It came about because I was obviously, since I've been writing about culture war stuff, and doing the podcast, I hear from a lot of people saying things like, thank you for talking about this. I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like there's something wrong with me or I'm crossways with my friends and this or that. So I feel like I'm not the only one. Thank you for making me feel less alone. So I would hear that kind of thing. And I also teach writing classes, just having nothing to do with politics or culture wars. I taught at Columbia for many years and now I teach private workshops. So I was teaching these private memoir, personal essay workshops on Zoom. Well, actually, I was doing them in person, too, in my apartment. And so I had people coming into the class and I was noticing more and more that they would come in and like a lot of people wouldn't even want to write. Turned out that they just wanted to be able to sit around and know that it was a place where they could talk about certain ideas. They knew I talked about certain things on the podcast and they knew I was going to talk about them in a certain way. And they wanted to be around other people who were interested in talking about those things. It was specifically that a lot of female students were voicing this to you. Yeah, classes were co-ed, but I, you know, I had a lot of women and the women were saying something very particular about the way they felt isolated. They were saying things like, 
all this tribalism and these political divisions, it not only makes me worried about my job, and those are the kinds of things men say as well. Now, what's so interesting here, again, is because TLC and estuary is, like my estuary is 50-50 men and women, which is, which is good because church tends to be heavily women, especially older because men die younger. But what's so fascinating is that this is women say as well, but they say, you know, it also has broken my heart. I have lost friendships over this. Family relationships are falling apart. I feel like I can't speak out. I can't say what I really think, even if it's a barely anodyne point, like something that would have just been completely normal thing to think four years ago is now verboten. And they were saying, you know, so as a result, I just don't say anything. And I am silenced and I go to social events and I really just hold my tongue. And that's the way I live now. And so I was noticing that in the sort of micro level, like people's personal lives are really being affected and women's in particular. And then I was also noticing that like in the podcast space, it was very male dominated. You know, there are obviously like people like Barry Weiss and Bridget Phetasy, and there are women who are very outspoken and doing well, but it's very male dominated. And I was wondering why that was. And I really started thinking about just kind of the way that cancel culture maps onto a lot of the sort of in-group, out-group dynamics that women are particularly good at weaponizing. And I just thought, wow, women are being affected by the culture wars in a very particular and potentially damaging and certainly heartbreaking way. And invisible, an invisible way. Having followed a lot of these heterodox podcasts, especially in that like sweet spot of the 2017 to 2021 zone, you're right. Like it was almost what 95% male podcast hosts. I don't even know if this is a great analogy here, but I just had this conversation with a friend that said that women are super underdiagnosed when it comes to autism because the ways that the autism manifests are different than the way male autism manifests. Yeah, they mask. Exactly. And so it just goes undiagnosed because the symptoms are different and you're looking for one thing and not seeing it. And so I think similarly, I'll cop to this, when I would see all these male hosts talking about cancel culture and the culture wars and all this other stuff, I think how I internalized that was that, oh, I guess men are just more interested in this stuff. It never even occurred to me, I think because I just didn't see it, that women were probably equally concerned about it, but just didn't feel like they could speak up. Yeah, I think that you could make the argument that men are more interested in some of the stuff. I think these things are true, like these big five personality traits. Women are more agreeable. There are evolutionary reasons that women tend to just go along with things and are often happy going along with things. Like they've got other priorities. But I think for the women who are maybe the outliers or just aren't quite agreeable enough, there is a tremendous sense of loss in losing your community and losing your social circles. And so, yeah, the podcast space is very bro. It's a lot of men and we can talk about why that is. There's probably a bunch of reasons. But yeah, I just I, I was seeing more and more women. They were wanting to talk about this stuff. And frankly, a lot of them came into the sort of heterodox dissident space during COVID, after COVID. A lot of it had to do with lockdowns, school closures, stuff that affected them as parents got totally tangled up in culture war stuff. A lot of stuff around gender that really exploded during COVID. So they were dealing with fighting with other parents about masking and school closures. And suddenly you were like a fascist if you thought one way or the other. And the next thing you knew, they were arguing about bathrooms. And, you know, it was just on and on and on. So that really animated a lot of women. So I had the idea. I said, OK, well, what would happen if I just took a bunch of women to some beautiful place and we just spent three days talking? <laughs> it's very simple, very simple. And it was totally off the record, no social media. And I don't, I don't have the yonder bags, but we're on the honor system. You know, I'm going to have a discussion schedule and I'm going to facilitate these conversations and I'm going to be careful. I'm going to screen everybody and know who's coming. And when I did the one in at my sister's place a few years ago, we didn't even have the estuary protocol. Now I feel even then it was just, we sat down, we just started talking. We just sat in that room and we just talked the whole time and conversation went great. And I think, I think now with the estuary protocol, I can actually structure some things and do some things with it. And I think it'll be really cool. Who's coming and know what they're interested in, maybe bring in some guest speakers. And I just did a little test balloon and it was magical, absolutely life-changing. It's the simplest concept. It's just so simple. And so, yeah, I did that one in the 
almost a little over two years ago. And then I think I've done, gosh, probably 15 retreats since then all over the country. How big is the average attendance of one of these retreats now? They're small. They're still small. Okay. That's what makes them great. So yeah, I usually cap them at about 16. Sometimes they've been as small as nine people. Wow. That's what's great about them. It's not big. It's not like some corporate thing. Like we don't have breakout groups. We don't have talking sticks. We don't have ice breaking activities. It's just sitting around and talking. I have a schedule and it's not like we're all over the place. I try to keep us on task and the guest speakers are amazing often. And and some of them are overnights. The sort of signature sanity spa offering is three nights. But sometimes they're just like during the day, we'll do a weekend. And it's just ineffable. Like these women are like, this has changed my life. This has changed my life. I did not know how much I knew I needed something, but I didn't know what it was. And I don't feel so alone anymore. I don't feel crazy. And they form their own little local communities. I mean, now there's like a bunch of women in Denver that get together and hang out and a bunch of women in Seattle. And it's all over the place. Minneapolis. Unofficial satellite offices. Right. They just get together. So, uh, yeah, we have women who've come back from multiple retreats. And we have an online community now, too. So a little over a year ago, we launched an online community that's a totally private membership based. You get in there and there's many different discussion forums and book clubs and we have guest speakers. We have our unspeakers series. So we've had people like Kathleen Stuck and Rob Henderson and Carol Hooven and various authors come in and hang out with us privately, private Zooms. And so that's also very robust discussions going on in the unspeakeasy community. So, yeah, guess I lied to whatever three years ago when I told you I would never do such a thing. <laughs> so that just, of course, you know, some differences is ours are open. I mean, I just again, I was just in the Bridges of Mean Discord. And I know if the, I just renewed the link, I used to have a permanent link and then the bots came. And so I have to have a link that expires and I never know when it expires. And so I just wait for a comment and the comment section says the link's expired. So then when I get a chance, I'll open up Discord. And today when I went over to Discord and went over to Bridges of Meaning, I thought, oh, what's going on in there? So I clicked on it. Oh, there's people gathered in a little in a little, in a a little, little chat room and they're all voice chatting. And so I dropped in and a whole bunch of OGs were there. Jeff was there and Cassidy was there and Julian was there and uh, Matt C was there and Phlebas came. And it was like, oh, look at this. It's just like Bridges of Meaning 20... 20. I don't know when the OG times were back in the Bridges of Meaning days, but then Fleba said, yeah, but no Joey. Yeah, but no Joey. Well, Joey, Joey is around. Um, Joey, Joey's around in Sacramento. He's alive and well. I don't hear about as much Joey because I don't have kids living in Midtown anymore, but, um, and my son and my new daughter-in-law live way up in El Dorado Hills now, so they don't see Joey's much either, and my other daughter lives in Oakland now, so anyway. But yeah, and so I listened to this. I thought, eh, Chad, this is this is really, this is in many ways much more really the mirror of us, but sort of the women's side. So I don't know. Maybe Megan Don and I, maybe Megan Dom and I need to have a conversation. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's that. And it's a little after five. Wife's home. Better go see what's going on. But. Yeah, there's. I don't know what I'll do with a thumbnail. Won't be, or, or some crazy thing. Um, it'll be. It'll be like the thumbnails I always make. Because I frankly um, have a lot of respect for bad YouTubers. If they're doing something good with it. So, anyhow, I always I get these emails now from you know, some some place. We'd, we'd like to help you grow your audience. Oh, really? Um, and have you ever listened to any single thing of mine ever? Probably not. And um, so, anyway. And, and again, I don't, I don't mind growing the audience. I think growing the audience would be a great thing. And I, I really like what, what Dave said about it. He said, oh, Paul's sort of the, Paul's sort of the guy who has the, the, you know, the comedy club or the, you know, the music, the music hall, and he brings different people on stage. And, and I like doing that because again, I watched, 
I, li I listened to the whole thing. Uh, Kale and Sam and Mo talking. And I think in many ways, the TLC is all about making the kinds, having the kinds of conversations we want to have, which is similar to the Inklings, which was, oh, there weren't the kind of books we wanted to read. So Tolkien and Lewis and Dyson and, you know, they just decided, yeah, we're going to write those books that we'd like to read. And so a lot of what the TLC is, is making the videos we want to watch and having the conversations we want to. And um, I learned a lot about Harry Potter and I really enjoyed this. And I'm not yet done with the... Uh, I'm up there. Not yet done with the Not Estuary Show, Episode 7, but getting to see Diane and, of course, McMo and and Clint and Matthew and Teo are not, and Chad are not strangers to the to the scene. Well, I took off my hat, but um, yeah. And so small is beautiful, small is beautiful. And will it grow? I hope it grows. It needs, in some ways it sort of needs to grow even just to stay the same. And so we do want some growth. But again, I think the real critical question is the speed of growth and the capacity to grow because once you have growth if you don't have capacity to growth to grow then then the growth actually can kill you so anyway um oh <laughs> chad's not estuary so got a climate change uh little banner from youtube how how about that i wonder what they um i wonder what they talked about to provoke the the algorithm to um, put that little warning down there. So anyway, there's a video. Um, leave a comment and uh, let me know what you think.